are the rushing waves, mountains of molecules, each stupidly minding its own business, trillions apart, yet forming a white surf in unison. Ages on ages, before any eyes could see, year after year, thunderously pounding the shores as now. For whom? For what? On a dead planet with no life to entertain. Never a rest, tortured by energy wasted prodigiously by the sun, poured into space, and might makes a sea roar. Deep in the sea, all molecules repeat, the patterns of one another until complex new ones are formed. They make others like themselves, and a new dance starts. Growing in size and complexity, living things, masses of atoms, DNA, protein, dancing a pattern ever more intricate, out of the cradle onto dry land. Here it is, standing. Atoms with consciousness, matter with curiosity. Stands of the sea, wonders a wondering. I, a universe of atoms, an atom in the universe. Wow, I thought that was a pretty darn good poem. Um, so, who actually wrote it? Wow, who wrote yes. that? Who wrote that, indeed. Um, I wish I could claim credit, but it was not me. It was um, Richard Feynman. Um, oh, but but wait, but wait, what what is this? <laughs> yes, yes. What is this? All right. So SG2 on space, the only weekly space show. Of course, hopefully you're watching it on youtubecom slash streams. Um, I, you know, obviously. Uh, Please support the show, patreon.com slash SG2 on space. And of course, there are audio episodes available on podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash SG2 on space. And I should say the disembodied voice in the background. Let me see. There we go. Hey, Shen. Hey, look at yeah. this guy. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Leonard Kramer with his um swag on my head as always I the headband have, i also have my peace sign also the peace sign i i just have a beetle <laughs> thing that's it but maybe one day i would get cool enough and get a headband too How, um, how's it going what what are we going to talk about well i was going to get to that so uh this is sgt on space only weekly space show so Today, episode 180, remember last time, if you saw it last week, um, or whenever you saw it, um, we said, hey, we're going to talk about Richard Feynman on our next episode. Right. Because for some reason, I think we, at the end of our episode, we started talking about him. Well, um, that has been a kind of a turn in the in the series of, of, of talks. We've been talking about, like, famous scientists. I think we talked about Maxwell. and We did talk about then, Maxwell, true. Yeah, and we yeah. also have talked about... Uh, we talked about some other scientists before in the past. Um, well, yeah, um, various, various, uh, have various scientists. Right. Um, so the, you know, at first glance, hearing that poem, you might think, oh, wow, this guy's actually a decent poet. And he is. He was also an yeah. artist and in some ways a comedian, author, obviously a theoretical physicist. There's quite a lot with uh, Richard right. Feynman. But um, I'm going to be asking Leonard here questions because Leonard actually has read a lot of his books more oh, than yes. I have. Oh yes. Um, uh, he's including... one of my favorite. He's one of my favorite people. Um, so he's... why is he one of your favorite people? Let's well, start there. Well, um, when I was in graduate school, for, first of all, you know, he was born in 1917 and he died in 88 or 89. Uh, he he came to uh, prominence around the time of the the uh, uh, to public, you know, public uh, being publicly famous um, around the time of the shuttle, the first shuttle accident, shuttle Challenger, because he was on the Rogers Commission that investigated the accident there, and uh, um, and he actually did have like a dissenting opinion, and there was that sort of thing. We can talk about all that, but the reason, uh, and that was that was about the time I was in graduate school, also, and so we became uh, um, affiliated or understand uh, knowledge about him because he was also he was a great physicist, Nobel Prize winner for uh, um, for the uh, um, 
you know, electrical effect, uh, the effect of electrons and electric fields or electric field theory. Uh, and, and, um, uh, but he was also extremely gifted. Ec- um, there he is. Yeah. A very gifted, um, lecturer and educator. Uh, he always wanted to try to, to explain things very simply. I mean, I'm sure you, we, you can go on YouTube and find, uh, a lot of of uh, lectures and uh, interviews that he's done over over the years prior to um, his death, um, but uh, that's why. And so, um, do you have uh, his book, the yeah. Feynman Lectures on Physics? I happen to guess that we might be talking about him. So, so there's this series of books. <laughs> so I just happen to have them at hand at hand here. Well, uh, the for, Feynman for... Lectures on Physics, and so so when I, these were actually targeted at um, undergraduates at Caltech, where he was a professor. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and it w- they were done in the early 60s. And it covers all of physics, undergraduate physics, uh, from, from you know, Newton, Newton's um, laws to uh, all the way to quantum mechanics and cosmology and, um, and, and all that good stuff. Um, but um, uh, what happened a lot of times was that uh, he'd be lecturing on these. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there's some students. There Richard is. Feynman talking with a uh, teaching assistant. Yeah. After the a... lectures on the dependence of amplitudes on time. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably maybe that's the Heisenberg uh, equation that they were talking about. And but then, I, I don't know. Yeah. April 29th, 1963. Right. So. so they were doing this, this, this was a set of lectures that he did. And, um, it's like just, I, I, I can't really, yeah. So, so in the old days they had a blackboard, it was a, tr- and they wrote on it with chalk. I don't know, maybe a lot of our audience has never seen that. Um, <laughs> they used to have, uh, <laughs> and so he would write things out. Yes. And, chalk on so, blackboard. Imagine so, that. So, so the thing is, the thing is, it, it's, it's, I, I can't, I, I, I can't explain it you know, that well, but you know, he, he would explain things very clearly um, and in a very original sort of manner. And sometimes he was sort of a little bit off base or in a different kind of direction than the traditional approach to physics. Um, not, not a not in a bad way, really in a good way. But um, I think that it kind of he didn't connect with the undergraduates. Undergraduates, you know, right. when, for the first four years. So I think he probably didn't connect with them as well as he did with the graduate students. And so a a, um, a, a story that I heard was that he would start the semester and he'd have all these undergraduates in the class, maybe 120 students in the lecture hall. And so as the as the semester wore on, the students would would drop out. But then graduate students who were more advanced, you know, people working on their uh, master's and Ph.D. would come in to sit in on the class. And so he never knew that the class was that everyone was dropping the class. Right. So so ultimately, you know, I think I think from the from the university's point of view or the physics department's point of view, it wasn't really that successful as a as a um, undergraduate course. But the lectures, the lectures are 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 cherished by um, people with uh, people who've been to graduate school to study physics, like like I have, and and uh, many of my classmates from that time will will uh, will w- would be able to hold up their copy also. And so it's just it's just you you uh, you go through there and you you he he just makes you understand it and he has these simple drawings he's a he seemed to be a very good artist he could draw yeah he say, enjoyed I, drawing too yeah i i think that i think these drawings were done by him but i i don't know that for uh um for certain um and so you can see he covered things like how how does water evaporate from a surface and um uh, and i mean and, just like yeah. is the enthusiasm there is it's pretty interesting too. Like, uh, I mean, let's give an example. Um, well, like even even just like his introduction right there. Like, uh, let me see. I'm just reading this a little bit. So, like when he started here, this two-year course in physics is presented from the point of view that you, the reader, are going to be a physicist. This is not necessarily the case, of course, but that is what every professor in every subject right. assumes. Yeah. If you are going to be a physicist, you will have a lot to study. 
200 years of the most rapidly developing field of knowledge that there is. So much knowledge, in fact, that you might think that you cannot learn all of it in four years. And truly, you cannot. You will have to go to graduate school, too. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then yeah. it goes on. Try try uh, chapter 19. Can you get to chapter 19? Because we talked about the principle of least action. Uh, is that no? Chapter, maybe it's chapter 19. Which he book? Had, maybe the second, second. Uh... Wait, let me see. Read. Uh, or maybe this edition book, maybe? just doesn't carry it. Maybe this, yeah, volume two. Volume two. Many electromagnetism and. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's right Chap here. Chapter 19. 19. Oh, look at that. So, That's beautiful. So I, I really enjoyed this lecture. It was almost like a lecture where he was taking time out and. Um, and so he starts out, you know, when I was in high school, my physics teacher, whose name was Mr. Botter, called me down one day after physics class and said, you look bored. I want to tell you something interesting. And so that that's what he was. He was. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that that the students were looking bored. And so he decided to tell him and he says, Then he told me something which I found absolutely fascinating and have since then always found fascinating. Every time the subject comes up, I work on it. In fact, when I began to prepare this lecture, I found myself making more analysis of the thing. Instead of worrying about the lecture, I got involved in a new problem. And the subject, the subject is, is this, this, the principle of least action. Least and action. so he's got some neat, nifty uh, drawings about, remember, I think last time we talked about how um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, this is the Lagrangian formulation where you, if you take the, 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 potential the kinetic energy and subtract the potential energy as expressed in the in the appropriate coordinates then then the integral of that along a trajectory there he, he drew a trajectory you know the actual motion is the minimum and so actually you can, you, you can scroll down and mm -hmm. let's see what else he has to say so he says see there there could be any kind of motion and you see it it, it kind of like it kind of has a little edge to it you know where he's, you know, he's just drawing an imagined motion but of all of the all of the different um, uh, paths that are taken by a particle between two points, the one mm -hmm. that the one that exhibits the least action um, is is the is the one that fit, that nature uh, causes it to, to follow. And so, anyway, this this actually is one of my favorite chapters in the. I mean, so, definitely it explains it pretty well. In other words, the laws of Newton could be stated not in the form f equals m a, but in the form that the average kinetic energy less the average potential energy is as little as possible for the path of an object going from one point to another. If you right. take the case of gravitational field, then if the particle has path x parentheses t, so x with respect to time, uh, we take a trajectory that goes up and down and not sideways, where x is the height above the ground, the kinetic energy is one half m yeah. plus t squared, yeah. and the potential energy at any time is mgx. Now I take the kinetic energy minus the potential energy every moment along the path, integrate that with respect to time from the initial time to the final time. Let's suppose that the original time t1, we started some height, and the end of time t2, we're definitely ending at some other place. Then the right. integral is, he writes it like this, the actual motion yeah. is some kind of curve. It's a parabola if we plot against the time. Uh, so anyway, anyway, yeah. it's a completely original kind of thing. Uh, most undergraduates uh, don't get this, you know. But but when he's speaking to the graduate students, it it's it's just a it's just a tremendously useful resource. You know, today we've got the YouTube videos, and I'm sure the students are all using the YouTube videos uh, to to un to learn stuff. Um, but uh, this is what we did in the old days. So, so what he did, okay, so, so he went to graduate school, I think starting in 1935, and then um, it got his, he was working on his PhD, and then the war came um, uh, uh, several years later. He was all working during that time, uh, and uh, um, um, he got sent to Princeton. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he got sent to Los Alamos, and he tells all kinds of funny stories about uh, the war, about working on the atomic bomb, and um, how he would play tricks on people. He learned how to pick locks, and and he would, he would, he was just a he was just a very annoying character uh, from from what I annoying what I character. Yes, he he but he, yeah. Um, there there he he must be he must be about twenty years old in that picture. 
And so <laughs> I don't think this is a mug shot, but it's... <laughs> That does look like but, one, right? I mean, he seems right. too happy to be in a mugshot. Right. So um, he, you know, he was he, working on the Manhattan Project. So what they had him do was he was working on one of the one of the ways of separating uranium two thirty five from from natural uh, uranium, you know, uranium uh, metal that that is refined. Um, uh, the the uranium came in two. There's really two flavors. Most uranium is two thirty eight which is not fissile that will not that you can't use that for an atomic bomb but uh, the, it's the it's the it's the lighter um, right. version of uh, isotope of uranium called 235 and so it's a very because it's chemically they, they're chemically they're identical separating them is a very hard thing to do and he worked on a on a um, cyclotron method where they would um, vaporize the uh, the 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 metal the uh, uranium metal and then run it um, make an ion turn it into ions and run it around a, a, a magnetic field so that the heavier elements would would execute a larger a, a wider arc than the lighter ones no I have that wrong no you know I have that right and so you could collect them in that way but they turned it turned out that that was not the method that the 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 army um, uh, selected, but he worked. So there's some very famous guys that he worked with. Um, but he was not famous at that time. But he did know all these guys, and he got to meet Einstein. Not not in not in uh, New Mexico, but so he has a lot of stories to tell about that. Um, he said uh, he said that he he somewhere you can find uh, an account of him. His wife was sick. She had uh, tuberculosis, and so they had brought her there also, and she was in the hospital and also um, at home. And so they would write back and forth, and they would write. They would. He would write letters in those days. There's no email, you know. So he was. He would write every he day. Would actually, write letters. Yeah. yeah. And so he he would. And so so he had this situation where uh, one day he got a letter from his father, and it was just a series of dots and dashes or dots and on, you know, two dots and then three dots. And it was a code. And so they weren't allowed to communicate in code, but this was something that came in from outside. And I have a feeling that his family, this was from his father. This letter was from his father. I, I think that they were just trying to, you know, perturb the system, sort of be, they were, they were being mischievous about this. And so they brought him in and said, what is this? And he says, it's a code. He says, well, what does it mean? He says, I don't know. <laughs> he says, well, we need to see that we need to understand what you're doing. You can't be writing in code. He says, I don't know. It's just that this this is what we do in our family is we write, we send codes to each other and see if we can figure out what it what it means. So he he made it like it was a regular practice, and so he kept this this the uh, sensors um, busy uh, or off base a lot of times. And so he has all kinds of funny stories about that. And, and so it's, it's, it makes him very endearing and people, people should, should, uh, you know, go on YouTube and see if you can find some of the lectures and, and interviews with Richard Feynman. So uh, there's one where he's just talking about magnets and the, the English. I, and... I, I just realized I muted myself and I was asking you a question and then, then nobody yeah, and, heard anything. And I didn't know, I, I, I was just ignoring you and, yeah, it's it's but, fine to ignore me. Yeah. Is this one example? That must be one of the examples. And so he, they they Short had ciphers by a named scientist in Los Angeles. The first was I don't know. So so you know, and it turns out that he, you know he did actually as a child he was kind of a prodigy as a as a uh, in mathematics, but he he wanted to know how the world worked and the role of imagination. And right. one of the stories he tells is, um. An artist friend of him, a, a friend of his that that was um, an artist, sort of criticized him for saying, you know, you physicists, you know, all you know is the mathematics, and you can't appreciate, you know, the 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 beauty of a flower, for example. And he you know, he he rejoin, he, he answers that by saying, well, wait a minute. You know, I can enjoy the flower and I can understand it, but I also know that, you know, that there's chemistry involved and that the physics of, you know, and then that that um, the flower has has, you know, certain biology and and and, you know, he, he points out that he can understand he can appreciate even more. There's even yeah. more to appreciate the, the beauty that he sees available. 
you know, and so he has available because he's a scientist. He has available he's, to him, you know, the appreciation, appreciation, and he really. I, did. I, I agree with that. I mean, yeah. like, so he said, like, um, as, although I may not be quite as refined aesthetically as he is, he describing himself. Richard Feynman's friend, yeah. I can appreciate the beauty of flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he does. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension at one centimeter. There's also beauty at smaller dimensions, the inner structure, also the right. processes, the fact that the colors in the flower evolved in order to attract insects so, to pollinate it is interesting. Yeah. So he had to have been a great guy. I mean, just uh, I had heard that, you know, he did have an ego, but somehow he could make you, uh, uh, you know, he, he could make you feel comfortable um with and and uh um but um you know that that he's sort of uh he's sort of a, a curious he's also, character. i mean he was also like a artist too right i i don't doubt that he had interest in in everything so yeah, this is yeah this is, this is this is where he's talking about um they're in one of his he has three popular books that people can can uh, pick up um i i can't tell you the name one of them is surely you're joking Mr. Feynman, and that's his experience. Uh, I think most of that experience is in graduate school and working on the bomb. Um, and then um, uh, he has he has uh, one book where he writes about the um, uh, the pleasure. Okay, um, the the uh, I don't know I don't know about the pleasure of finding things out, but that that's typical. And the character of physical law. So these are popular books that you can pick up. I have a book. Um, called QED, which is about quantum electrodynamics, the thing that he really got the Nobel Prize for. And you can read it. You know, you don't have to be a you you can read it and and you'll understand. You don't have it. to be a he, you don't he, have to he, be a physicist to he, understand he, it. Like he in, yeah, he there there it is. It, it he invents a way of describing complex numbers without using any math. He just has little arrows and the little arrows rotate around. And and so it's a wonderful. I, I really recommend that that book. Um, I have one. I have it around here somewhere. And you have this one, so, the key, the same yeah, the matter. So, and a few of these others. That surely you're joking. And then there's a the. I, I don't remember which of these where he talks about his experience with on the Rogers Commission, with the. I think it was this one. What do you care about what other people think? Adventures of a Curious Character. Yes, I have that one around here. Yeah, I think that's the one where he, yeah. he does uh, that near the end. I'm, I'm on mm -hmm. So what did he do with a Challenger disaster? Well, he, he so the story about the Challenger disaster was that um, the Challenger uh, was destroyed on takeoff. I don't want to say it exploded, but it was mm -hmm. destroyed uh, because the because the solid rocket boosters, if people know about the, the um, architecture of the shuttle, was there was a main fuel tank and then two solid rocket boosters and then the main orbiter vehicle had engines as well and so when it would take off these solid rocket boosters were giving it the main impulse for getting um, up out of the atmosphere and so um um the the solid rocket boosters were built in segments and using o-rings o-rings are like a rubber kind of material and um they they launched at a colder temperature than they should have and it has to do with the politics and the pressure that was put on the contractor uh, morton thiokol in in utah to um to you know clear this for launch on that day and and uh so there were two there were two members of the board important members one of them was sally ride and she was kind of uh, representing the astronaut program. And there was a, a, a general, an Air Force general named Kutina. Um, I don't know if I'm pronounced his name right. And he was in charge of um, a, a, a missile program, a rocket program for the Air Force that kind mm -hmm. of competed with the uh, shuttle. And so the two of them, they, I, my take on it is they already knew what had happened, but they they were politically sort of constrained to stay within their own domains. So they brought, um, they brought Feynman in to be kind of like a, a non-advocate reviewer so that he didn't have an ax to grind. He didn't have any politics and he was well known as being, you know, um, a, a curmudgeon, a person who would just get to the facts. And so 
um, that's what he did. And, and uh, uh, he, he uh, actually, he was sort of off task for, he went down to Marshall Space Flight Center and he's, he claimed, I found out what happened. The engines exploded and all this stuff. And, and so they had to call him, Kutina had to call him back and say, no, no, here, I want you to go over. I want to just suggest that you go over and look at these O-ring things. Oh, so right so it's, it's like, the, yeah, Sally Ride and Kutina, they already, they already had a pretty good idea about what happened, but they, they needed to have somebody non-advocate to, to uh, right. confirm. And, and on YouTube, you can, there's, there's, there's the, the, the hearings, you know, the public hearings are all, uh, on there for you to listen to, and you can hear the engineers from Thiokol, you know, talking about the pressure that they were under to um, to clear this thing, and and they didn't explain it very well, and all these kind of things that were going on. But what happened was that these O rings they lost elasticity, and they were and so they were supposed to stop the gas, the hot the pre high the hot high pressure gas that's in these rockets from escaping mm -hmm. out through the sides. And so that was the solution that they, they used. And so they had separate segments that they could put together and they were sealed with the O-rings. Right. And so when on, on this day in January, it was very cold in Florida, uh, 27 degrees, there was ice everywhere and, and all that stuff. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the contractors were saying, we don't think you should fly, but then they said, go sharpen your pencil and see if you can clear it. And they weren't sure. And they said, we don't really think this is a good idea, but then they flew anyway. And there was an accident and every, and, and all the, the entire crew was killed. Um, and so, uh, um, they had this, the, the, the Rogers commission was the investigation that led to this. So he had, he, he, I, I wouldn't say that he really discovered it, but he led, he led, he discovered the, the flaw, but he sort of l lent um, his creds to the conclusion of the hearing. I believe it was the correct, I believe they did have the- He used his hardware store pliers to pull a rubber bit strand of O-ring off the model. Then reasoning that a temperature of ice water that waiters and waitresses delivered to commissioners was close to 32 degrees, a close match for the air temperature when Challenger launched, he dunked the chunk of rubber into yeah. this ice water. Wow. Right. And, and then he said, you know, so when he, sh he showed it, I said, I think this may have some bearing <laughs> on, on, uh, like, on what happened. He held up a chunk of O-ring for the TV cameras explaining, I took the stuff that I got out of your seal and I put it in the ice water. That discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it doesn't stretch back. It stays that was the, same the point. Yeah. In other so. words, there's no resilience in this particular material yeah. when it's a temperature of 32 degrees. Yeah. So that, that was that was sort of like a, a like an off the cuff uh, right. uh, description of of what they think happened, and and it is probably true. As so, Feynman's but, friend yeah. and fellow physicist Freeman Dyson puts it. The public saw with their own eyes how science is done, how a great scientist thinks with his with his hands, how nature gives a clear answer when a scientist asks yeah. her. Clear and so I, I've seen him interviewed where he's talking about, you know, when you see with your eyes, you know, um, mm -hmm. you, you see through a little hole in your eye, it's a little apparatus, and all of the electric fields that are going all around and everywhere, and then they enter through your eye, and then they make a an image on the back and and so he said he would he was always trying to imagine how things really were what it really meant and challenging different ideas about about electrons and and the electric field and that's actually what ultimately led to to him getting um you know the main contribution to quantum electrodynamics and it, and one of the things that he's famous for was this remarkable um way of ex of describing uh um charge particle interactions he, and so they're called Feynman diagrams what is that well if you can probably google Feynman diagram so you you what it, what you do is you put the you you draw a little picture of an electron say or any kind of particle and then there's various probabilities that it will interact and there you see two electrons and they exchange a photon and that's the wiggly line so space and time, and then the the uh, the one electron goes off in the other dire one direction, and the other goes off into a different direction. And so these were very useful because you can assign numbers to all the probabilities. And then the, then, and it's not just electrons; it's just all the different kinds of um, particles. 
And this really actually more than anything else, really, I think kind of got him the, the, uh, the Nobel prize because it's, it's, it, it just demonstrates the, the, um, the original way of thinking about this. So instead of writing a whole bunch of, you know, equations. dull equations, he would, he would use this sort of kind of like a, 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 a drawing. And then, then you could write the probabilities of each of these things occurring and, 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 um, show how they, they, the reaction would, would, um, progress. So, um, and you know he had he had contributions to even uh, computer science and nanotechnology, but this is really the big thing. And uh, you know ultimately it was this kind of analysis, this contribution, that the Nobel um, uh, Committee decided to um, award him. In in I think sixty four was when he got the Nobel Prize. And so that is really remarkable. Right. Um, he he uh, he writes that um, they he and his wife got a, a one of those uh, VW vans or a Chevy van, and they repainted it with Feynman diagrams. <laughs> really? Yeah. I I never knew that story. So, um, he he was married several times. I don't I think that his first wife died uh, from tuberculosis. Uh, um, uh, you know, and then uh, maybe maybe. He, was divorced and then he was married again he has uh he's he has uh um he had a sister who was also a scientist i think her name was there is that it yeah so so they have a van that's a that's a dodge van isn't it is that it well the fireman van in front of the mark taper forum for the play T E D. bought oh in 1975 bought a new dodge tradesman maxi van had it outfit in long beach according to the cultural mores of the time with a mustard yellow avocado green interior and a customized mirror mural exterior right so there's Feynman diagrams all over the outside and that's his license plate which is pretty funny so he gives you idea so um he has two children i think um his i don't remember their uh, I don't remember their names, but but um, his daughter is some kind of photographer, and I believe his son is is in the technical field. I don't know if he's a physicist or or what. His sister was a was an astronomer. I think her name was Joan Feynman, and uh, she died in uh, about about five or six years ago. So, um, and. He's a, he's a curious character, and uh, I, I, I have all of his lectures, and I still read them, and I still learn something from them, and uh, um, and that's all I can think of. That, that's Joan Jeff Feynman. Biden. Yeah, he had a um, his 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 uh, his family were were Jewish. I don't I don't know if his um, I think his father was american came from america but his grandfather came from so, the old country the um, parents both Ash, ashkenazi Jews okay let's pronounce this correctly it's ashkenazi did i say it right i don't i don't think so but <laughs> anyway <laughs> Ash, ashkenazi jews all right yeah although he was not religious yeah. uh, i don't think either one right. of them were particularly you know religious but that that you know that is you know that is their heritage um who they were uh he was he was uh um i think that his parents had another son who died uh quite young so it was just it was just the it was just he and his sister um, and um he, he i don't think he i don't think there was anything really special about him when he was growing up i he was very bright and his father uh, influenced him greatly to to uh understand the world he he talked about his father as saying that you know it it's 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 uh, it's not enough just to know the name of something. I think there there where he he talks about how how you know somebody one of his friends would say, hey, do you know what kind of bird that is? It's a ruby throated bud rusher rusher or something. And but then you don't know it, you know. And so it, you know it, you don't know anything about the bird. You just know the name. So knowing the right. name of something is not knowing it. And, and I know you've run into people like this, you know, who'll show Definitely. off that they know the names of things, you know. Right. Like, that doesn't really mean anything. And they yeah, and and so he 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 didn't uh, suffer uh, those kind of people very 
very lightly. He, I, 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 you know, uh, and people like philosophers that would talk to him about uh, with all kinds of jargon. And he didn't, he didn't, uh, he was not, he, he hated pre pretense people who were, who were pretentious or, you know, tried to sh put on airs and show um, what they knew. And so he, he, that was not somebody that like, um, uh, that he was, uh, um, yeah, no, would, I mean, that's... tolerate, uh, and so, um, I think, um, the, one of the scientists that we sometimes talk about is Leonard Susskind, who was a, a physicist at Stanford. Right. Um, and he knew him and you can go on YouTube and, and hear some of the, the discussion about when, um, when, uh, Leonard Susskind uh, interacted with him. They, they were, he, they were kind of friends and I don't know if they published anything together, mm -hmm. but. Apparently um, Wikipedia doesn't quite have it, but then, you know, that's not always a complete resource. Yeah, right. So, oh, there's the lecture. Yeah. Those are the lecture notes. You can buy them. Those are hardbound. And, um, you don't, uh, yours is. Yeah. I just have the paperback copy and I've had it for over 30 years. You were showing how your pages are now yellow. Yeah, when I when it was new, so you see it looks kind of yellow. Actually, even in the pic, in, even on the film on the uh, on the video here, they kind of look yellow. Um, when it was new, it was it was they were white. These pages were white, and you can see notes in here. I've taken notes in the margins. All this discussion about electrostatics and and a lot of things we talk about, you know, like I I, I originally would would get it from here. He what also. A, he, what's something that really sticks out to you in in what you read? That that lecture on on um, the uh, path integral, the um, least action principle of least action, uh, but all, all the stuff about electromagnetism. He's not so good with thermodynamics. There's some areas of thermodynamics where he's a little bit um, um, slow. <laughs> Um, well, <laughs> well, I guess you can't be exporting everything, right? Well, sense. I mean, you know, it's a different different times that he would he would uh, work on things and and have different kinds of different skills and different interests in in uh, topics. So he's mostly interested in that least action principle and electro electrodynamics, right? Um, chemistry uh -huh. and all. Well, chemistry is really physics, you know. Is, it fun, is the fundamentals. So. Anyway. I mean, I think that's, that's one thing he likes to realize that, you know, if you go for, further down, fundamentally, it is physics. So, right. Right. Yep. That's, that's sure. all I had to say. Did you want to talk about anything else? Did you have any questions about Richard Feynman? He, he is my hero. He's one of my heroes from, I never met him or anything like that. Uh, and actually, he his life was coming to a close at about the same. He died from cancer. I think he had liver cancer. Yeah, um, they say is and, it is it because of his earlier work in uh, on the Manhattan I, Project. It's possible because they were kind of careless with the, the you know people were exposed to uh, plutonium and uranium and and it's it's a it, it's occurred to me that you know he he may have uh, been exposed to some some of the hazardous materials on the on Manhattan. But on the other hand, you know, it was more than 30 years um, when he, he, so, and people get cancer, right? I remember him um, somewhere, some, I, somebody was interviewing him uh, who knew him when he was sick. And uh, I don't remember who it is, but it's some prominent scientist. And they were saying, you know, well, you know, I'm going to miss you. you know, he's having this conversation. He said, I'm going to miss you. I'm really feeling bad about this. And, and, uh, so he replied, or he's quoted as having replied, says, yeah, um, yeah I'm kind of down about that, too. But m maybe not as much as you might imagine for some reason. You know, really? so it's like, yeah, he kind of accepted the the and and um, in if you if you look at the video of the Rogers Commission, he's he was sick at that time. Um, so he, he only lived about another year after the Rogers Commission. So yeah. he was willing to accept his own death or his own mortality yeah. gracefully. Right. He says, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out about it, but, you know, not as much as you might imagine, you know. So uh, so that was interesting. Um, I wish that he was still around because um, 
I think he would really be a YouTube personality. I really think he'd be. Really? Yeah, I think he'd be a YouTuber, and we'd be reading, seeing all kinds of stuff. And, um, but, uh, and you know, just he he would you know the stuff that we're doing with nanotechnology and artificial intelligence, and he'd he'd be right on the forefront of all of that. I, I know he he did make some contributions. This is from a TV program that an English TV program where they followed his life. Uh, it was about an hour long, and he 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 he. he uh, he discusses a lot of different things. This obviously so, has no sound, but are you saying they followed him around for a little while? Well, they did a they did a study of his. You know, it was it was about him, about his life, and and uh, it was in the early seventies. So he he was he was late fifties right. or mid fifties in this, and he would you know he talks about magnets and you know. And you're asking a why question, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, anyway, how come we don't have sound? Uh, cause I'm sharing a window and not a tab, oh. but honestly here, let me see. Unless you hear anything. Do you hear anything? Barely. No, it's not. Oh, it's that's okay. okay. Yeah. I will. I will, anyway, I will, uh, that's what I have to say about Richard Feynman, and I, I, I encourage our audience uh, to go out and look him up on YouTube. And, and and if you're really into physics, you have to get the if if you want to study physics, you need to get the Feynman lectures, and then maybe take a class and and learn the stuff because it's how so. It works. To understand it, do you feel like you have to understand? Do you, can do you have to? Do you have to have some background? First? Well, well, the Feynman lectures are not books for popular. Um, they're they're they are for serious study of physics, right? Um, if you want to be entertained and you want to learn, you can still learn things. You can get his book on QED, and that's that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. And so it's it's such a remarkable, um, um, you know it's it's such a remarkable work that you can penetrate it very easily without knowing a lot of mathematics or anything like that he, he just had this i don't know just this this talent for being able to explain things and he i think that he he would say you know if i can't explain something to a five-year-old i don't really understand it then i don't I really understand that about it. the quantum mechanics actually where he realized he didn't couldn't understand couldn't explain it in that QED, level. he does say he does say that he says, "Look, you know, you're not going to understand this. It's okay. I don't understand this, right?" And so it's not so much they don't understand it as that there's just a great deal of discomfort with with the conclusions. You know, the idea that there are stochastic things going on, and the prob it's the probability that's being followed. So it's it's a it's a very unintuitive um, kind of thing, and probably the the sort of thing that his kind of mind. Um, sort of could get a handle on because he had this, he, you know, and the importance of imagination. People don't think of physicists as being imaginative, right? Uh, but, really? Yes. I mean, that's that's sort of like a thing. Well, you know, you're a nerd. You know, you you think well, with yeah. your right brain. You're you're not a left well, brain. Well, no, no, you know? no. People say you think with your, your left brain, right? Yeah, whatever it is. You know, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that there's anything to that. Okay. But, yeah, but you know. Yeah. So, oh, and another thing. Okay, one other thing. So, you know, he he didn't um he he liked to talk about the what it means to know something, you know. So, remember we said something we said that, you know, knowing the name of something is not knowing it. And so there's a story he tells about where when he was in graduate school um and what's this? I'm oh. just putting down. Oh, OK. Yeah. So he said, like you know, they, they used to have these things called a French curve. Right. And it's a piece of plastic. And you, and if you're plotting gra plotting data, you can use this curve to fit it and then draw a line manually. And so somebody was asking him, one of the other students was asking him, you know, what what is the equation for this curve that you have mm -hmm. for the French curve? And he held it up and he'd say, um, you know, he held it up. He held it up and said, well, it's a special kind of curve that the tangent at the lowest point is horizontal, right? So so if you take a curve, imagine a curve, right? Mm -hmm. And then 
you you take a, a straight edge and you you bring it up from the bottom and you touch it well the the tangent at the bottom is horizontal well that that doesn't say anything okay but people they because all curves are like that there's no, there's no special curve everything that's curved it's it's the tangent that a, attaches to the bottom of the curve is horizontal every right. curve it doesn't matter so but he 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 described it this way and it, it sort of and so people were kind of like oh is that what that is and 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 then they realized that it was it was a joke really um but it it highlighted like the the fact that people will hmm. not really understand things you know they will think they understand something and they'll put it away it'll it'll go in a in a corner in a box in their brain and they'll think they'll understand. They'll pull that out and say say it, but they won't really understand it with the kind of depth that um, maybe sometimes you you. And also, we accept things a lot of times. And so well, one, of his fam- one of his famous famous things is about uh, brushing brushing your teeth. And he says he, he 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 challenged the the conventional wisdom that brushing your teeth was did anything. That it was, you know, it was really good. so, but you know, so he, <laughs> he says, okay, so the earth is turning and the limb of the, of the, or of the sunlight, you know, in the morning is, is rotating around the earth. And so there's this line of sunlight that's rotating around the earth. And all along that line, there's hundreds of millions of people <laughs> brushing their teeth and it goes around the earth. <laughs> and he says, and it may be just all for naught. It just doesn't, you know, and, and so he, you know, and, and he, you know, he would hearken back to like medieval times when people believed in witches or they believed in all kinds of, you know, and so we, we laugh at them and we say, you know, or we, we, we sort of, you know, um, don't think much of, of people in ancient times who That's thought of so weird things, but what are the, we're the same people. We're the same species. We have the same I mean, apparatus. Our conditions are different. Like, well, I mean, like you brushing your teeth, for instance, it's, it's assumed that that's where you're supposed to yeah. do. Right? And so, so he's just saying, you know, I don't know yeah. of any research. I haven't seen the research. You go to the, you go to the dentist, they'll tell you to brush your teeth, but they don't know either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I have heard that he did not brush his teeth, but I don't know if that's true or not. So, I mean, I would like to brush my teeth just because, he, you know, it's, I, you know. It feels better. And also I floss, I you know, I floss every day and you should too. So, but I, I just do I, that I, because. I, I, why? Why should why? you floss every day? Right. And so there's all kinds of like things that are almost <laughs> like religious impulses and things that we, right. we, which might be like, they're just. They're just like habits that we we do, I, and and he 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 would point that out. And so, um, <laughs> there's a story where he was at a party, and people were talking about how animals can smell, right? Mm-hmm. And he claimed that he was able to, um, he was able to identify people by uh, smelling their hands, smelling their fingers. Really? That's yeah. So, and, and, oh, he studied ants. So he was in South America and he got interested in the ants there. And so the ants would put down a little chemical trail and one ant would follow another ant and he could get them to go in a circle. Right. And that he discovered that there was, there was one or two um, species of ants where mm-hmm. the trail was, was unipolar. It was, it was unidirectional. It had directional information in it. And so that when the ants would come to one of these trails, it would turn right consistently. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it was, so, but other ants didn't have that. So all kinds of things that he observed about about the world. And that's why, that's why it's, that's why. I've heard of the the ant story. I mean, that's kind of fascinating how Mm -hmm. he was, you know, it's, you would think it's like not his realm of expertise at all. He played played the bongos. It said that he went to strip clubs and he would study there. Um, I'm not. I don't yeah, know I've, I've read in one of his books that he uh, he would go to he would go to strip clubs and um, draw, go draw and uh, just yeah. hang out there. Well, and he played the bongos, and there's recordings of him playing the bongos. I didn't ever really think that he was that great at the bongos, but um, I've you know I've heard the recordings, and uh, so he was just a he 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 enjoyed life, and he he uh, um, and uh, he was a he was a great person in the 20th century that it would be nice to have him around today yep 
Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, but his last words, his reported last words were, do you know what it is? No, I don't. I've never heard that. Richard Feynman's last words. Well, actually, he, I guess he, uh, I would hate to die twice. The Stein business is boring. Aw. <laughs> okay. I mean, supposedly, that's, that's uh-huh. his last words. Yeah. And then on his, um, the, his last words left on his blackboard at Caltech was, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Okay. So, pretty, uh, I guess, one okay. of them is, is thought-provoking, uh-huh. the other one's uh, kind of funny, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, you must really like this guy, since most of the, the last 50 minutes was you talking. We've been talking then, for 50 minutes? Can you 51 believe it? minutes? Wow. I'm, I'm not okay. going to go into the weird stuff today. Enough okay. of that. All right. But I got. I do have to say um, thank you to our supporters and patrons, Kyle Baker, Sam Welsh, and Atim Ra, the last of which was my producer for about a year and a half. With that, support the show on patreon.com slash SG2 on space. We will be back next week. Um, look up because you never know what you see. Um, I'm not going to say you're going to see Richard Feynman. He's, 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 he's dead. But you're, you, as I was talking, but you, you know, you can see all the wonderful um, things out it. in space, you know? Who knows? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just look up. Yeah. Um, Cheer keep up. doing that. All right. Yeah. And with all that, I will say. Namaste. And that's right. Namaste. Look up because you never know what you will see. And we'll see you next week. Mwah. I knew it. <laughs>